attention that preventing people from moving when something terrible happens is what makes trauma a trauma. I've always thought trauma happens when something outside of me makes me stop taking action, but I feel that I stop myself so often. Lisa, that is a great question. And it gets to the heart of really defining what trauma is and how the body experiences a trauma response. And so I will go into that in this episode and answer your question at the end. We're going to focus specifically on a step in the body's trauma response that I call the wall. The wall is that moment when we stop taking action. It's a pivotal moment when we feel powerless and that is what is then shifting our inner physiology from a stress response to a trauma response. And you're absolutely right, Lisa. There is so much more than just external forces that hold us back and prevent us from taking action. Let's talk about the wall. So in, in my work, in my research, and in my book, there are the steps that the body takes to go into a trauma response. And I'm going to focus on the step of hitting the wall. It's step number three. And this is the step that holds all of the significance because it's exactly what Bessel is referring to in our conversation in the main episode that you definitely should go back and listen to. The wall, hitting the wall, <laughs> hitting the wall is not a physical barrier. It's not a physical wall, though I suppose in some circumstances it may be. It is the moment when we realize that there's nothing more that we can do. It's the moment where we experience complete inner powerlessness. If it were a physical wall, it would be the point where we are running away from a danger. Maybe a dog is chasing us. We're running away and we come to a wall. And this wall is so big, so thick, and there's nothing that we can do to scale it, to get around it. And the danger is now trapping us. We've hit a wall. As long as we are still running, as long as there's still a chance that we're going to get away, as long as there's still the possibility that we're going to overcome, we are in stress physiology and it's being fueled by adrenaline and we are taking action. It's all about movement. The stress response is all about movement. And when we hit that wall, that is the moment that Bessel was talking about where it's preventing us from taking movement. It's preventing us from taking action to overcome a problem in our life. And it's that preventing of movement that takes that stress response and now makes it a trauma response because now there's nothing I can do. I'm trapped. I'm powerless. And it makes me feel all alone. Some of the other words that Bessel refers to in the main podcast conversation is this element that in that moment that we hit the wall, it feels unbelievable. We can't believe what is happening. It feels unbearable. The sensations that it creates in our body feel so awful. It feels unbearable. And it all is overwhelming. It's all too much. When that happens, it's a very different physiology that our body shifts into in order to survive that. It's a very different physiology to survive powerlessness than to try to overcome a danger. We shift from a very active survival response in the stress to something that feels more passive. And it feels like a passive surrender. It's the realization that if there's nothing that I can do, then the best survival strategy is to give up, is to give in, is to shut down. And that's exactly what the body does is after it hits the wall, steps four and five and the trauma response are the freeze, 
the freeze is that initial moment of it's unbelievable. It feels like a shock. I can't, I can't believe that this is what is happening. And it also is a way for our nervous system to paralyze us. Immobilization is a key strategy of that freeze response. Whether or not we actually immobilize on the outside does not matter as much as what's happening on the inside. So we can still be moving, but on the inside, we feel paralyzed. And then there is the shutdown where it's just the ultimate survival strategy to survive powerlessness. This is the biology behind the comment that Bessel made that preventing movement is what makes trauma a trauma. Again, the reason for that is because as long as we can take movement, as long as there is something that we can do, we are in stress. All of our body and physiology, the biology behind that is creating the energy to move because there's still a chance that we can overcome. But it's when our movement, our ability to take action and respond is blocked that our physiology shifts and says, well, then the best thing for me to do is to shut down and save my energy rather than to use my energy. This takes us to a conversation with polyvagal theory because the neuroception is what determines whether I should take action or whether I should shut down, whether I should move or whether even I should block my own movement. What you were just asking, Lisa, with your question. So neuroception is not based on reality. Neuroception is the perception of our nervous system, of my capacity against the danger in front of me. And when that danger is so big, and my capacity feels so small, then my nervous system is going to say, we should stop trying because it's futile. There's no way that I'm going to overcome this problem. And rather than waiting, I should just stop and give in now. And that's exactly what happens. And in this case, our own nervous system is preventing our movement. And it is more powerful than our logic. There is no amount of willpower that can overpower our neuroception and overpower its decision that there's no way that we can overcome this one. So this is where we might feel like we're in a room surrounded by people, but someone has just said something and we feel paralyzed and we feel ourselves shutting down and our world spiraling out of control. Did anyone actually physically block my movement? No, but my nervous system felt overwhelmed. It felt like this was an inescapable life threat and it shut down. It prevented my own movement. It goes deeper. And this is where I want to leave us today is that there is a biology even behind this because the more inflammation that I have in my body, the more toxins that I have in the body, the more nutritional deficiencies I have in my body, the more that my nervous system is going to create a perception that I have limited resources. It's constantly checking what is the status of my energy? What is the status of my immune system? What is the status of my nutrients? Do I have everything that I need, not only to create the energy for what I need to do right now, but to rise to the occasion to overcome this new challenge? And when it receives information from our mitochondria, when it receives information from our DNA, when it receives information from the tissues around our cells or the extracellular matrix, and it receives the information that we're struggling just to perform at this level, as soon as that next challenge comes, our nervous system is going to prevent our own movement because it knows we're already running on a low tank. We're already running on deficiency. We already have low limited resources. We're not going to be able to respond and we shouldn't try to respond. We should try to save the little energy that we have. And so rather than responding with movement, our nervous system 
blocks our movement and our body goes into the shutdown trauma response. It is fascinating to me that our own body, our own nervous system can be what blocks us from taking action and can be what blocks the movement that makes something stressful become a trauma response for our body. So going back to the main episode with Bessel and his statement that it is the preventing of movement that makes a trauma a trauma. This can be people, places, and things outside of us that prevent us from being able to move. Maybe if we have an experience of physically being trapped, maybe in a car accident or other ways in which we were physically from the outside trapped and not able to move. Yes, that is the key factor that will make that situation have become a trauma rather than just a stress. We weren't able to move. We weren't able to respond. But what happens when our own nervous system, sensing all of the toxin burden and the deficiencies and the imbalances that exist within us, decides that we should not take action and it prevents our movement. That is a key concept of the biology of trauma, where it's not just that trauma impacts the body and creates lasting changes in our biology, but then that same biology creates this feedback loop and creates messages to our nervous system that tell it that we're not able we're not capable. We're not resourced enough. We don't have the capacity to perform at a higher level than what we are right now. And any new stress, any new challenge, any new danger in response to that, we should just shut down because we don't have the capacity to respond with movement and action. Coming back to your question, Lisa, to directly answer your question. Yes, <laughs> there is so much more than external forces at play. And you are correct in being able to observe that your body is going into a trauma response, sometimes just all on your own. We can hit that wall. That wall is what prevents our movement. We can hit that wall from the factors within us, our own biology, because it comes down to our neuroception and the, the cues or the messages that are coming to our nervous system that are cues of danger, that are cues of deficiency, that are cues of insufficiency. And they can create internal barriers just as powerful as external ones. And when Bessel talks about prevention of movement, he's describing both. He's describing anything and everything that will prevent our movement. What makes this understanding so powerful is that I can now recognize the importance of my own biology. I can recognize the importance of my sleep, of my gut health, of my hormones. I can recognize the importance of addressing those imbalances for my healing journey. Yes, my diet, what I put into my body, the toxins that I expose myself to are going to affect how I'm doing in trauma therapy. Because the more of the imbalances I have in my biology, the more that my body is going to already feel burdened and already feel like it does not have the energy for anything hard, including personal development. Action steps, what do we do? First of all, it's very helpful for us to be recognizing when we have hit the wall. When I first started learning all of this, I recognized that I was hitting the wall every single day, sometimes multiple times in a day. It's not just the big traumas. It's the everyday things that were overwhelming me, the emails that were overwhelming me, the paperwork that was overwhelming me, and noticing what I did in response to having hit the wall. Because once I saw that, I could backtrack and I could say, how can I support my body better? so that I'm not continuing to hit the wall every day, knowing 
the impact that it's having on my biology when my nervous system goes into that trauma and shutdown state. And so we want to track our nervous system and know when it has hit the wall to the best of our ability, be able to notice when it's approaching hitting the wall so that we can pull back. One of the ways in which I encourage you to do this, because this is what really helped for me, is track your capacity. Every day when I get up, I look at how well did I rest? How well do I feel? How does my gut health seem to be today? Because that will determine how I navigate my day based on my biological capacity. This is one of the reasons why I wear an aura ring. It helps me know my biological capacity so that I can manage my mental health and my emotions based on that fact. It helps me know when I am more likely to shut down in response to a challenge or problem that I wasn't expecting. And so it helps me navigate my day and my relationships better. Second of all, learn to recognize those early warning signs. Maybe for you, it's going to be cravings for sugar. Maybe for you, it's tension in the shoulders or a twisting in your gut. For you, it might be very specific to you, but the more that we can recognize the early warning signals, the more that we will be able to understand our body and, and pull back before we hit the wall. And third, how can we support our neuroception's perception of safety? Can we put things into our environment that are going to be cues of safety? Can I put more plants in my environment? Can I surround myself with pictures of people that I have good relationships with so that the messages coming to my nervous system from my environment are ones that promote a sense of safety, not our cues of danger? Because as I work on my biology, I also want to change my external environment to be one that will support a message of safety rather than of danger. With that, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to that full episode with Bessel van der Kolk, author of The Body Keeps the Score, episode 116 of The Biology of Trauma. This has been The Biology Behind It miniseries. I'm Dr. Amy, your host, and I will see you next time.